Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Saraba with Comerica's marketing team, and I'm joined by John Lynch, our chief investment officer. John, hello. Hey, Susan. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Glad to have you here and happy to have all of you here who are watching our LinkedIn Live. Today, we are talking about the market outlook for 2023. And John, before we get into it, I wanted to ask you to tell us, for those people who may not be familiar with you, tell us a little bit about your background. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, name's John Lynch, Chief Investment Officer for Comerica Wealth Management. I uh, have been in the business now for, this is my 38th year. So hopefully I'll figure it out at some point. Uh, haven't yet, uh, but but still working at it. It's a, a labor of love, certainly. Uh, you know, really enjoy the, the strategy aspect of my work, the portfolio management, work with a great team, great partners. And, uh, you know, it's just been a very fulfilling career and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And I love the fact that, yeah, after all this time, I'm still learning. You know, we have very weird year last year, right, with, you know, full employment, yet GDP declined and we entered a bear market, even though everyone had a job, you know. So it was a very interesting period. And uh, but there's always there's always something different. You know, you never want to say it's different this time. But uh, I, I think the six inches between our ears don't change. But. You know, there are always different catalysts for the market that you need to uh, adjust and pivot for. So I find that very challenging. And I, I, I certainly take, you know, the role of steward of our clients assets very seriously. So I'm always endeavoring working with my team to make sure we're positioning portfolios correctly so our investors can achieve their long term goals. OK, great. And I also love the fact that you study history. And so you often are educating us on what's happened in past decades or past economic downturns or recessions. Uh, and that helps, I think, give us comfort that things are always going to work out in the end. Absolutely. You know, not with, not without their hurdles, you know, yes. but uh, yeah, hist history is a great guide, I think. And uh, certainly anytime I, I tap into history, you know, I'll call my parents and let them know that, you know, that BA wasn't a waste of money. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the report that you wrote was very in-depth and you covered policy, economy, bond market, interest rates, equities, global markets, currency markets. You covered a whole lot of subjects there. So we have that on our website if anybody wants to read that in depth and we'll put a link to it at the end of this broadcast. So we're going to go over those topics today and we're going to start with policy. Now, with the current climate, what do you see in terms of policy on the horizon? Yeah, I'm afraid the current climate is even more muddled than before. I thought it was, you know, confusing right after the election, right? Everyone expected this wave election and that did not occur. Uh, but now we're in a situation where I just I just checked before this program began and we're, I guess we're on our seventh vote for Speaker of the House. And if the Speaker of the House vote is anything as, as a proxy, if you will, for legislation or debt ceiling, things along those lines. I'm afraid we're in for, uh, you know, a fair amount of gridlock this year. You know, looking at history, if you want to look at just the, the third year of the presidential cycle, you can see here on this chart that the third year tends to be the most favorable because more often than not, in the midterm election, the sitting president has lost control of the House, usually given up an average of 30 or 40 seats. And therefore, you see fiscal spending programs, monetary policy tends to be accommodated. They're both positive historically for the equity market. And oddly enough, we've never seen recession in the third year of a presidential cycle. So history would suggest that uh, by purely looking at you know, the calendar, that it will be a good year for the market. I, I do believe we're still in a situation where this year could prove to be an exception to the rule given the war in Ukraine, given, you know, aggressive monetary policy, multi-decade highs of inflation, not only in the U.S., but throughout the developed and the emerging space. So I think we're going to have, you know, a few more challenges uh, than is requisite for the, you know, the prior year three experiences. And to the degree, if I may, Susan, that uh, we see policy gridlock, I also want our investors to, and and anyone on this call to, to, to be very mindful of the idea that, you know, fiscal policy uh, was able to, you know, we were able to respond rapidly 
you know, to the pandemic, for example, uh, and spend six, eight trillion, depending on, you know, who's counting. Uh, but nonetheless, now that the Fed has raised interest rates, I think it's going to be very important for investors to really get an appreciation that fiscal policy, you know, we're expecting a mild recession this year, for example. If it's a severe recession, I don't believe fiscal policy is going to be in a situation where they can just throw two or three trillion at this thing. Uh, you know, interest expense as a uh, as a percentage of GDP, interest expense as a percentage of uh, tax receipts, however you want to uh, term it, interest expense is going up, and I think that's going to crowd out uh, what we traditionally would have viewed as. Uh, 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 discretionary spending. So consequently, I don't know if fiscal policy is going to be the big deal this year. As you see on this next chart, monetary policy, I believe, will be the big deal. And, uh, you know, Fed Reserve Chairman uh, Jerome Powell uh, raised rates seven times last year, went from zero to right now we're in a range of four to four and a half percent. And uh, And what I think investors need to be mindful of is that the markets right now are pricing in interest rate hikes of an additional call it, you know, 75 to maybe even 100 basis points from current levels. So, uh, you know, if we want to look at the dynamic between fiscal and monetary policy, monetary policy, I think will have all the headlines this year. And I F definitely want to emphasize to investors, just because the Fed may stop at five or five and a quarter, it doesn't mean they're going to three anytime soon. And uh, I believe that's uh, a mixed message that the yield curve has been showing us. And I, I, I want investors to be prepared. We saw Fed uh, Reserve minutes yesterday from the policy meeting from uh, the end of last month. And, you know, they, there was no ambiguity there. They were, you know, they were the angry dad driving the car, right? I'll stop the car. They're, they mean it this time. You know, they're, they're going to keep interest rates elevated. Uh, to, to prove their point against inflation, you know, inflation has peaked, we believe, but we still think it's going to be persistent. Okay, John, let's talk about the economy now. You mentioned interest rates and inflation, which definitely impact the economy. So we're all wondering what's it going to be like for 2023. Sure. Uh, our chief economist, Bill Adams, uh, joined the firm about a year ago. He's become a great partner and a great friend of mine. I'm really uh, appreciative of his cooperation and partnership with us. Uh, you know, he's done a great job, you know, analyzing the economy and interest rate forecasts and inflation. And he and I speak quite a bit, you know, uh, very exciting topics as far as he and I are concerned. Maybe not for everybody else on this call, but he and I enjoy geeking out together and, uh, you know, discussing a lot of this stuff. And, you know, what Bill's opinion is, and I agree, fractional growth this year. You know, the U.S. economy, you know, we're one-tenth of one percent for the full year after growing only 1.7 percent real GDP last year. The Federal Reserve, I think, is at one-half of one percent for uh, calendar 2023. And what's unique about the situation is that we have such a low unemployment rate, you know, sub 4% currently, and we experienced this last year in the first half, right? We had negative output, but everybody had a job. So, you know, was it a recession or not? It doesn't look like it was a recession, but it sure felt like one. And now certainly we're seeing, uh, you know, housing starting to decline, uh, you know, Leading economic indicators are declining. Uh, consumer confidence is declining. Uh, yet consumers still have a trillion on the, in cash on their balance sheets. Uh, corporate balance sheets are still strong. Uh, we have unemployment rate of 3.7%. You know, we think that's going to go to 4.5%. And any time we've seen an unemployment rate increase by one half of one percentage point, we've had recession. So we do believe that we're going to have a mild recession this year, yet we don't believe the traditional cyclical pain will be experienced given the fact that household balance sheets are strong, corporate balance sheets are strong, corporations have refinanced a significant amount of debt. And certainly, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, everybody has a job with the unemployment rate below 4%, uh, that should also uh, act as a buffer. But inflation is the big deal, Susan. If you see on the next chart, uh, inflation has uh, come down a bit from our peak levels. The, the, the consumer price index 
had peaked at about 9%, I'll say, in the third quarter, second, third quarter of last year. And uh, the most recent print in November showed that the consumer price index on a headline number declined to 7.7% year over year. And a primary message that Bill Adams and I want to get across to our investors on, on the on the pricing standpoint, the inflation standpoint, is that the move from 9% to 7% is the easiest of the 200 basis point move or the two percentage point moves that we can experience over the course of the next year or two. Uh, uh, you know, we do believe inflation has peaked if you think about, you know, supply chain, logistical situations having eased, China opening up, you know, there are a variety of things that have, you know, taken off peak pressure, but we do want to emphasize that wages are sticky, home prices or rents are sticky, uh, energy prices, even though gas price of gasoline has come down, we're still seeing some elevated pricing and some stickiness in uh, uh, some energy or commodity pricing. So consequently, we still think that will be sufficient to uh, keep inflation elevated above historical averages this year. Uh, I, I admire the Fed for their optimism about returning to price stability at 2% this year, but I just don't think we can achieve it. I think there are too many, uh, too many uh, roadblocks before we can get there. I think we can ultimately get there, uh, but I'm not convinced it's a 23 dynamic. Okay, John, interesting stuff. One other thing that I wanted to mention, you talked about the job market staying strong. The JOLTS report that came out earlier this week, the job openings report, we still have a lot of job openings, even though we've seen a number of layoffs as well. I mean, have you have you noticed that dynamic before? Yes, it's uh, again part of the you know 38 years of still learning. Uh, you know, we have essentially 1.7 job openings for every job seeker, and I believe what the the Fed is trying to do is destroy those job openings before they destroy jobs. Right. So we've saw we saw Salesforce yesterday. Right. We saw Amazon, 18,000 jobs. You know, we're seeing a lot of technology companies with announcing tens of thousands of uh, job cuts. I think what the Fed will try to do initially and what they what they've been doing. Is that they want to raise rates to the point where companies are. Uh, hesitant to add to their payroll. So I think they can achieve their objective without causing too much pain, which is why, again, we're looking at mild recession as opposed to, if you will, a hard landing scenario. So that JOLTS report stands for the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. And we still have 10.5 million job openings, uh, maybe you know 4 million job seekers, something along those lines. And that's how you get the 1.7 job openings for every uh, job seeker. So still have some work to do there. But I think that's where we're that's where I would prefer to see you know, job disruption, dis, uh, disruption, if you will, or job destruction. Uh, and I'd rather see that in the job openings, uh, jobs available as opposed to, you know, hitting the working force too hard. Oh, that makes sense. I wanted to mention that John will be taking questions when we're done with uh, going through some of these different topics. So if you have any questions for John, please go ahead and put them in the comments section. All right That's now right. we're gonna move on to the bond market and more on interest rates. I know you touched on interest rates, but let's talk about what's happening uh, with the bond market and, and what do you anticipate for the rest of the year? Yeah, and I think the bond market, you know, first off and foremost, um, I know the bond market uh, really took it on the chin last year. The broadest measure of the fixed income market is the Bloomberg Aggregate Index, which basically has a balance between municipals, mortgages, I'm sorry, mortgages, corporates and treasuries. Uh, and when you look at, you know, if they're each about a 30 percent weighting, again, treasuries, corporate bonds and mortgages, that index was down about 13 percent last year. Uh, very painful for investors. You know, we had been a 40 year bond market. We had been warning of a 40 year, you know, the 40 year bond market, you know, would have to end. You know, things don't go up forever. And certainly once the Fed started raising interest rates, that certainly had uh, deleterious effects on, on uh, the fixed income markets. Uh, but what what I want to emphasize is that the short end of the curve now is 4%. So whether you read Barron's or the Journal or any other you know business 
publication, anything on, you know, uh, you know, digital uh, or mobile devices from any of these sources, be, you're, you're going to see articles that the 60-40 balance portfolio is dead. And, uh, you know, one bad year, again, I don't want to be dismissive of it, one down year in 40 years, you know, I'll take it. Uh, but what I want people to think about is this is not the time to abandon uh, the 60-40, if you will, the diversified strategy. If you can get 4% on the short end of the curve right now in a risk-free endeavor, uh, I think that is very, very important for investors to, to keep in mind and not to be swayed by uh, you know, the hit that the bond market took last year. The Fed had to go from zero to 4%. Uh, at a, a rapid rate with seven rate hikes, and that clearly had an effect on the bond market. What you have here in front of you is the uh, chart of the U.S. Treasury yield curve, which inverted first time in April and then again in June or July. And then since July, the inversion, as you can see, uh, when I talk about an inversion, that means short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. Now, anytime you've had short rates higher than long-term rates, more often than not, the economy has led to recession. Now, I think it's very important for inv investors to interpret this properly. There are some benign interpretations now saying that because the 10-year is, what, 375 and the two-year is, call it 450, 445 this morning, you got about a 75 basis point spread between twos and tens, so that's a negative inversion. Um, the benign interpretation of that is that the Fed is going to cut and run and start cutting interest rates this year because we've gone from 9% to 7% inflation. That is not how I'm viewing this at all. I think anytime you have, you know, I think it stands to reason that anytime you have short term financing costs higher than long term financing. So if small businesses or individuals are going to have trouble securing financing over the near term at the, rather than waiting over the long term, by definition, economic activity is going to slow. And uh, so consequently, we do believe a mild recession is in, in play for this year. Uh, I want to emphasize that, you know, we think at the 10 years of 375 now, maybe we finish up at three and a quarter or 350 uh, by year end. But, you know, it's conceivable we test uh, 4 percent. Uh, on the 10 year again, I don't think we're going to go back to 430 where we were last September, October, but still see volatility in interest rates uh, as the market tries to gain an appreciation for really what the Fed's trying to do. I will commend the bond market. I've always felt the bond market has had a, uh, you know, a better approach to the markets, if you will, a long time ago, 38 years ago, uh, when I first started out uh, on Wall Street, you know, uh, uh, I'll call it a uh, jagged veteran who was probably about my age now told me, and this was when Prozac was coming out, Susan, and, uh, in, the, in the early mid 80s. And uh, the fellow said that the equity market uh, was manic depressive, but the mon bond market had its medication right. And we've seen the equity market be very volatile this year, right? And the bond market has basically been saying, you know, things are not as good as equities have hoped on a couple of different occasions. We've had a couple of bear market rallies in equities. So I think what the bond market is telling us is uh, a more accurate depiction of what's happening in the slowing global economy. Uh, but it's not all bad news, because if you look at the next chart, while we've had a rapid increase in interest rates, I'd like to say that we've had an increase in rates, a surge, soaring interest rates, but we don't see credit stress. And what I mean by that is that the interest rate differential or the spread between investment grade corporate bonds and high yield corporate bonds relative to the benchmark 10 year treasury is still within their averages over the past 25 years. The spread for investment grade corporates, corporates are yielding what, five, 5.3% currently. They're only about 135 basis points spread relative to treasuries. You know, the high yield bonds might be yielding, you know, eight and three quarters or nine percent currently, but they're still within 400 basis points of uh, within four or five hundred basis points of the 10 year Treasury yield. So the fact that we're not blowing out from those spreads relative to history, I believe, is another uh, sobering aspect of the bond market that's saying, OK, yes, rates have surged, but 
spreads are still relatively well behaved, which I think points to uh, or fortifies our, uh, our, our argument, if you will, for a mild recession. So when we're positioning fixed income, uh, the fixed income portion of diversified portfolios, we're, we're favoring quality, we're favoring investment grade on uh, corporate bonds, we're favoring investment grade on uh, municipal, municipal securities as well. We think the tax equivalent yields are very attractive at current levels. And I know last year was very painful for the fixed income markets, but again, on a risk-free rate, uh, at four uh, percent, we think that is, uh, you know, a very healthy environment given uh, what, you know what we've experienced uh, over the past twelve months. So, you know, favor quality and fixed income. I still think Treasury is going to be a little too volatile, so we're not going to overweight Treasuries, uh, but definitely like the investment grade portion of the tax exempt as well as the taxable space. John, I'm glad that you mentioned this is not the time to abandon a plan that has worked for many decades, because it does feel like we're bombarded on social media sites, on the internet, different sites that we visit, and new sites, whatever, with information, like everybody's trying to tell you about something new that you should be looking at, but that's not always the case, right? That's right. That's right. I think uh, when you sell your soul, that's when uh, that's when you make a deal with the devil. Right. And, uh, you know, if, if you think about diversification over the long term, um, you know, we've we've been conservative. Right. You know, there were I received a lot of calls and a lot of people were upset with me because we didn't get involved in crypto, for example, over the past couple of years. Well, I'm glad we were steadfast in that. Uh, approach, right? Because, uh, you know, certainly the comeuppance has, has developed and, um, you know, we still think diversified strategies, you know, favoring quality and equities and fixed income uh, is the best way to achieve long-term returns. And now that, you know, interest rates are rising, I don't think we're going to see much from a PE expansion, which is probably a good uh, segue into our next section. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so our next section, we're talking about equities, and we have three slides, I believe, on equities. So let's go ahead and get started on that. That's right. So I think first off on the equity space, you know, don't want to be dismissive of, uh, if you will, the challenges the equity markets face. This is an S&P 500 index. I always like to use the S&P. I think the Dow is too narrow. Russell 2000 is too many. Uh, but the S&P, I think, is the best representation of not only domestic, but global economy, because 40% uh, of sales for the S&P 500 and uh, bottom line come from uh, international exposure. So I, I believe it's a great representation. And this is through the end of last month. Uh, but I do think it's important to just recognize that when you had higher interest rates, we've seen, uh, you know, a situation where investors have to discount future earnings growth at a higher discount rate. You know, when we were discounting earnings at next to nothing for the better part of a decade, a little more than a decade, right? 12, 14 years, if you want to go, go all the way back to 2008, um, that'd be 14 years where interest rates were next to nothing. Um, now that interest rates are at 4%, that really weighed on the big trade over the past decade, right? Growth, technology, uh, tech-like names that were in the communications or consumer discretionary space. Now that you're discounting those earnings, long-term earnings, what we call long-duration assets, long-duration equities at higher interest rates, that decreases uh, their valuation potential and consequently you have this volatility. Now, within the equity market last year, I don't think I've ever, in 38 years, Susan, I don't think I've ever seen the S&P 500 peak on the second trading day of the year. But that's what we that's what we endured last year. And it was a, a downfall thereafter. Uh, we had a bear market within months. Uh, we we got fooled by equities on a couple of occasions. We collectively as investors, we had two bear market rallies and, you know, we tried to get in front of those and we talked to everybody about, you know, be mindful that when the S&P 500 is below its 200 day moving average, that's typically when you see your highest percentage surges in the market. So we had a move what from middle of June to middle of August of about 15 percent. Uh, and then we had another move from the October low into December of approximately. 
ultimately you know, maybe 12 or 13 percent was that move. Uh, so I, did, I think we need to be respectful of bear market rallies. The overall trend uh, is still negative. And until, you know, we, we get through this recession, until equities firm, uh, I think investors need to recognize a couple of things that, you know, you know, I'm often, maybe I should phrase it this way. I'm often asked when, uh, when's the market going to bottom? You know, we never know when the market's going to bottom until we test that bottom. And our intraday low in the middle of October was 3,500 on the S&P 500. So we're at maybe 3,800 uh, this afternoon. And I think we're going to have to test 3,500 at some point. You know, we have uh, uh, typically the market needs to, to have what's known as a double bottom to firm before the market can really sustain a move again. And if we if we if we test that 3,500 on the S&P, as I suspect we will, likely in the first half of uh, of 23, I think at that point we start to look into better times ahead. You know, so we've had that volatility over the past year. We have a higher discount rate that affects growth. So we're, we're certainly favoring value. Uh, I'd also, you know, we've I saw a data point earlier today that 60 percent of actively managed funds outperform their benchmark. Now we haven't seen that since I think 2007. Okay, so it was very easy to be in a passive fund when interest rates were low and PEs were rising and just let things run. But in a higher inflation, higher interest rate environment, I just don't think you know we're, we're, we're positioned for that. And consequently, I think you're going to see more active strategies outperform passive strategies. I think we're going to be susceptible to bear market rallies. And I think the higher discount rate will continue to weigh on uh, some of the big tech names. You know, big tech, if you want to think about the big five or the big six names out there, uh, they were at one point responsible for 24, 25 percent of the overall market capitalization of the index. That means 90, 494 companies were only responsible for the remaining 75%. So it's really been an interesting period. Those big five or big six companies now are probably 20% of the index. In 2000, the biggest five or biggest six companies were maybe 15% of the index. So, you know, that's a challenging message and that some of those big names you know, all those household names, technology company named after a fruit, you know, has broken down. And, uh, you know, it's conceivable we see a little heavier uh, weight on those companies uh, going forward. But I do want to point out that the average stock, the S&P equal weighted index, actually outperformed the overall index by six or seven hundred basis points last year. So I think the outperformance of uh, value, the outperformance of active, and the outperformance of the average stock, I think, is actually a healthier environment going forward. Now, if we look at the next chart, uh, we're talking about valuation. And I think it's important to recognize that if the market, if you will, attacked or if the market targeted uh, PEs last year, I think the market is going to target margins and uh, profit or at least profit forecasts this year. Because last year we went from a forward PE on the market of 22 or 23 times earnings. We troughed at maybe 15 or 16, and then we finished up at 17 or 18. Uh, so the market really has already gone after PEs. But now I think market has to go, Mr. Market has to go after um, margins because margins, you know, have enhanced operating leverage for U.S. corporations, and I've been very impressed with the operating leverage coming out of the, coming out of the recession, uh, that there was a short recession, right, of uh, the first half of 2020. Uh, but what we need to keep in mind is that debt service costs are rising, energy costs are rising, wage costs are rising. So all those things are sticky, and I think they're going to take record margins in the 12 to 13% range for the S&P. And I think that's going to take it down to the 11 to 12% type range, which goes to the next chart, which will see uh, operating earnings for the S&P 500. We're forecasting at flat earnings this year. So uh, if we did call it 225 last year, I think we'll do $225 in earnings this year. Um, so it's going to be, there, there are going to be some challenges, but you know, if I'm if I can summarize before we go to Q and A, Susan, I just encourage everyone to think about peak, 
but persistent inflation. Think about a steadfast Federal Reserve, a mild recession, flat earnings, and an S&P 500 that has to retest the 3,500 level, the October low. And once we accomplish that, I believe at that point we will have been in recession, the Fed will take rates to five, five and a quarter, even if they have to go to 5%, five and a half percent. But then I think they hold rates steady. And as investors start to discount recovery in late 23, early 24, we have a preliminary forecast of 5% earnings growth for 2024, put a 17, 18 PE on that $237, $237.50 in operating earnings that gets us to about 4150 on the S&P 500 by year end 23. So, uh, you know, volatile first half, at times a painful first half, but we could see, you know, if we started the year at what 3840 on the S&P 500, we'll finish up at 4150. That's about 300 points, so we'll call that, you know, an 8% type upside potential after what has been a very difficult year and I think if we can get 8% compounded annually, we'll all be uh, We'll all be pretty pleased. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense, John. I want to go back to the comment you made about uh, you made about crypto and not getting involved in, in the crypto market. Um, and one thing I've always heard, I want to get your thoughts on this, is that you you should not be investing in something that you don't understand. And it's sometimes right. you have bright shiny objects that grab your attention. But what is what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, thank you for bringing that up because the bright, shiny objects is one deal, right? You know, they're the crypto uh, environment. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, there's an innovation there that I respect and I admire. Um, but governments haven't figured out how to regulate it, obviously. Uh, haven't figured out how to tax it. Uh, central banks haven't uh, fully concluded their plans for their own digital currencies, right? And if you have a digital currency backed by the full faith and credit, of a legitimate government, you know, that that can be, uh, uh, you know, strong competition, I believe, to, you know, the current uh, uh, examples out there right now. I do believe there's, there's, uh, if you will, more legitimacy, in my opinion, uh, for the whole blockchain, uh, you know, backdrop, if you will, I think there's some legitimacy there. Uh, but I, I do want to keep them, whether it's whether it's crypto, uh, uh, and there are still some concerns about tariff financing, right? Uh, uh, hacking. Uh, it's it's certainly not good for the environment. Uh, so there there are, there are a lot of things there that we need to be mindful of, uh, whether it's crypto, whether it's meme stocks. You know, and and you talk about you know understand what you own, and that was a that was a theme. And the very first book I read in the business, you know, almost forty years ago, uh, Peter Lynch, who, who I'm not related to. If I was related to him, I wouldn't be working this hard still. <laughs> Uh, but he wrote a book, One Up on Wall Street, and one of the lines in that book said, I don't understand asynchronous transfer mode, but I do understand a clean McDonald's. And that really clarified it for the BA in history from Villanova, right? And I just thought, okay, well, that's, that's something, right? There's, there's a fundamental case on understanding what you're owning, understanding what you're investing in, and there's a fundamental case for building a portfolio that you understand. And in a higher interest rate environment, I'd caution investors, and we're certainly not positioning portfolios to use the same trade that people used for the last 15 years. Uh, I'm not sure the value is going to outperform growth for the next 15 years, but I think for the next handful of years, we're in that situation given, uh, given the higher interest rate environment, for example. Okay. How about the global markets? What are you seeing for global markets? Yeah, global markets are also in a, you know, a difficult situation. I think the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank are, are well behind the inflation curve. They're well behind the Fed in their uh, you know, battle against inflation. Uh, so I, I do have some concerns there in the developed markets. One encouraging sign I'm seeing is that European banks, European industrials, European cyclicals are outperforming their defensives. Uh, we're still not there yet in the U.S., even though our Federal Reserve is so much more ahead of the inflation battle than those other central banks. So that's a, a recent dynamic that's occurred over the past five or six weeks. That I'm going to be paying uh, very close attention to. But with the opening up in China, there are a couple of challenges there. You know, cases are soaring, uh, but the pressure was too great. 
uh, so they had to open up the economy. Um, will that be, will that increase in demand be good for growth or will that increase and certainly supply chain? Yes. Uh, but will it be uh, a struggle for inflation? I'm afraid the answer to that one is yes also. So it'll be a battle uh, on the emerging state space between uh, you know, demand versus inflation or growth versus inflation. And I think uh, the inflation aspect may weigh a little further. And even though the dollar has weakened over the past handful of months, uh, I think you may see the dollar firm up a little bit, which would ultimately weigh on performance in developed and emerging market equities. Okay. My last question was going to be about the dollar. Was there anything else to say about the dollar? Is that Sure. Uh, King Dollar has uh, probably performed too well this year because the Bank of Japan was reticent to raise rates. The ECB was late to the party. Um, you know, so the dollar has gone from, I don't know, maybe DXY is the trade weighted basket of the dollar. Probably was as high as 112 or 114. Now it's probably 103 or 104 today. Uh, I think the dollar is going to, you know, hover in the low 100 area for the DXY and maybe get a slight a slight bid higher once the market recognizes that that when I talked about that yield curve with the uh, long rates pricing in a potential pivot on the Fed cutting rates this year. And I don't think that's going to be the case. And I think once once the market gets around to that, I suspect you're going to see, you know, 10 year treasuries because remember, the, the Fed is no longer, um, you know, they, they, are, they are not selling bonds, but they're letting mature, bonds mature. They have balance sheet reduction going on now. Uh, the Bank of Japan is no longer a net buyer. They're a net seller uh, of equities. They sold 18, oh, I'm sorry, 10-year uh, treasury. I guess they sold 18 billion, uh, or no, I'm sorry. I guess their holdings were down. Uh, I'll just say that, that the Bank of Japan's holdings are down significantly over the past six months because they've been trying to defend the yen against against the dollar. So consequently, that has been weighing also on, on Treasury bonds. So I don't think you're going to see that ballast that you would have had from the Bank of Japan previously and uh, the, the Federal Reserve. Consequently, uh, that I also think will keep, you know, the dollar elevated and what that would mean for, uh, you know, if you see a slight elevation in the dollar this year, I've uh, been very impressed with the way gold has been trading. North of $1,800, uh, gold has you know, made a very, very powerful technical move. Uh, oil, you know, WTI, uh, U.S. crude is probably $75 a barrel. I think that's going to nudge higher. And copper will be you know, the determinant on global growth. And unfortunately, copper has been uh, you know, pressured given uh, you know, IMF looking at probably only 2.5% global GDP this year, and that's down from 6% two years ago. So I still think the global markets, we're overweighting domestic stocks relative to uh, international for those reasons. All right, John. Well, we're at uh, 39 minutes after the hour, so we've got almost 40 minutes of hearing your knowledge. We really appreciate everything that you talked about today and all the insight. Uh, anything else that you want to mention before we sign off? Yeah, I just uh, want to thank you for your partnership, Susan, and uh, certainly want to, uh, you know, let everyone know I'm grateful for them tuning in today. And uh, again, I just want to reiterate, you know, my endeavor to provide, you know, investment strategy insight, you know, uh, uh, portfolio implementation to make sure, again, our clients you know, can achieve their long term goals. We're going to continue to have a conservative bent. We're going to continue to make sure it's a diversified strategy. And, uh, you know, we'll endeavor tirelessly to make sure that, uh, you know, we're positioning our clients and their portfolios properly. So thank you all very much. And uh, I'll look forward to our next visit. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time.